Hey friends, some of you are willing to listen to me talk about niche construction, so I'm going to do that. But first, I want to get one thing clear, and that is that there has there have been some very nice comments saying that my videos are kind of like a college class and learning new stuff about evolution and biology, um, but I have to bring us back down to reality a little bit. Uh, no, they're not. If, if this were a college class, what I would do is lecture at you for 40 hours or so and assign about 100 hours of outside work, reading, uh, self-study, all kinds of things like that. Uh, and there would be exams. There are no exams, okay? Uh, so this is really just a brief exposure to a few ideas that would hopefully trigger some further study on your part. Uh, don't think that this substitutes for attending uh, a class at all. Sorry. Yeah, it's, it's not like free tuition, which we should have, by the way. Anyway, this idea that, that uh, we ought to have some perspective on what's being accomplished here is one of the themes of this whole series of videos I'm making. I, I seem to be discovering. Uh, let's maintain this nice, even judicious perspective on what we're learning so that we don't get into this trap of thinking that everything is a revolution, is a brand new idea, is, is something worth overthrowing the old order for, because most of the stuff I'm talking about is not. But we see this all the time in the popular press. So, for example, some study shows a little bit of promise about some new cancer treatment in mice, and all of a sudden the headlines are screaming, cure for cancer has been found. Or Time runs a cover article on this revolutionary new idea that's going to completely cure cancer within a decade. No, it's not. Or what I sometimes see nowadays is some minor discovery in computer science leads to people saying, oh no, here come the artificial intelligences, they're going to kill us all. Uh, no, that's not going to happen either. Relax a little bit. So even sober scientists are prone to this kind of hyperbole machine. So uh, a few weeks ago I made a video about epigenetics, and that was really the point of it all, that here's this really cool, wonderful, exciting phenomenon that stands on its own, that is worth years of study, that's got all kinds of interesting implications, uh, and some small number of scientists want to claim that, no, this is, this is the grounds for a stunning revolution and we're going to overthrow the, in, the established order of evolutionary biology. And once again, no, it's not. It's cool, but let's, let's keep it real, all right? It's sort of the same thing for niche construction. It's cool, it's exciting. I think it's a great new perspective, a way to look at common phenomena with new eyes. But um, again, it's going to fit very nicely into standard evolutionary theory. It doesn't, it's not going to cause an evolutionary biologist any qualm to accept the idea of niche construction. And as, as an aside, why is there so much enthusiasm for this idea of revolutionizing evolutionary biology? It's a very strange sort of thing that's been going, but it sweeps through quite frequently that people announce that there's going to be some new discovery that's going to change everything, uh, and then of course it doesn't. I think it's because there's kind of a personal human dissatisfaction with the theory that what's going on is that evolutionary biology removes many aspects of your life from your control. You know, for instance, you can feel like, hey, I can go down to the gym and I can exercise and I can improve my body. Or I can go down to the library or I can take some classes and I can improve my brain. There is nothing analogous to improve your DNA. Your DNA is what you've got. It's what you're going to live with. Um, and there might be some slow degradative changes over the course of your lifetime, but there's nothing you can do short of real revolution in biotechnology to actually change your DNA. So we're constantly looking for these ideas 
that lead to some kind of personal involvement with changing our genetic structure, whether it's epigenetics, or in the case of niche construction, whether we can change the selective environment to make our particular genetics uh, especially, especially valuable to us. I would also argue that that's part of the appeal of eugenics, that here's this idea that there are these phenomena that we can at least improve the gene po pool by selection, leading to an improvement in DNA in the long run. Uh, but of course, eugenics is not a valid way to th think about the world. The whole problem is that you don't know what the destination is going to be. So arguing that we should tweak something by culling the weak is not necessarily going to lead to a generation that's stronger. So none of these ideas are actually going to lead to this kinds of, these kinds of improvements that people are begging for. Sorry to say. Now this is where some of the appeal of niche construction comes from because uh, what niche constru construction suggests is that it's fairly it's a fairly simple concept, and it says that what we can do is enhance our environment, and that leads to changes in the future in how the the population will look. Okay, sure, uh, but it's it's not really something that's entirely under your control. Let's explain niche construction with a simple example. Imagine that you are a primate that evolved in a tropical climate and you've shed all of your fur. Then imagine that you move to Minnesota, a cold, chilly place that is about as far from your species' homeland as you can get. What do you do? You can't instantly re-evolve your fur. So you build a house. Over generations, short generations, not long enough to generate significant differences in allele frequency. You improve the insulation, you improve the heating system, you make behavioral changes to cope with the weather. Congratulations, you have committed niche construction. Now, I have to distinguish this phenomenon from something else. So once again, imagine we displace a hairless ape from its pleasant tropical habitat and drop the poor thing down in a Minnesota winter. The first thing that will happen, actually, is a cascade of physiological changes. Shivering, triggering a red blood cell synthesis, the beginnings of an increase in insulating fat, behavioral changes. The organism responds and is modified by the environment. This is called adaptive phenotypic plasticity. It is not niche construction. It's the activation of biochemical and behavioral pathways that are already present in the organism to generate an adaptive response. And plasticity is a whole nother vast topic. The second thing that can happen, if we're dealing with a clever ape, is that they will try to modify their environment. It's cold out here. Let's dig a burrow or make a fire or build a house. That's niche construction, and it's a process in which the organism changes the selection pressures acting on it by modifying a hostile environment to be more compatible with its needs. This isn't just a matter of brainy apes and people, though. Rodents also do it. For one example, prairie dogs have to suffer through prairie winters, too, and they build elaborate burrows. It's hard to imagine a prairie dog without a burrow system. This is a case in which a species has become inseparable from its constructed habitat. I'd argue that humans likewise are now interwoven with their technology. You may be sitting there thinking, nonsense, you can do fine without your phone, but I'm talking about even more fundamental technology. I don't think our species could survive without fire, for instance. It doesn't require conscious intent either. Here's a fascinating example. The goldenrod gall fly. This animal lays its eggs inside goldenrod stems, and there is an immediate response. The saliva of the larva triggers an expansion of the plant cells, producing a large gall, a nice little home for the larva. It's their way of constructing a house. Furthermore, as the weather cools, the plant cells begin to dry out. 
and the larva senses the desiccation as a signal to start producing sugars that act as antifreezes. So we've got a reciprocal interaction going on here. On the one hand, the larva is secreting signals that compel the plant to build a house for it. And on the other, the plant is producing signals that can be sensed by the larva so it can make an appropriate res response to changing weather. Another example is the formation of biofilms. These are bacterial colonies. Planktonic bacteria from multiple species settle onto a surface and basically build a home. They rec recruit more bacteria with secreted signals. They build connections to the surface and to each other with proteins and carbohydrates. They adjust their metabolisms and their mit mitotic rates to this new confined environment. And then they secrete a slimy coat of more proteins and carbohydrates that ex insulate them from external threats. This is one way bacteria can evade antibiotic treatments, by living inside a layer of slime impenetrable to those agents. And that's also niche construction. Now, development in multicellular organisms like us is also a complex signaling network with cells talking to each other, uh, inducing pattern changes in gene expression and response. Notice how this diagram cell has complex internal pathways, but that these also extend outside the cell membrane. It's bristling with sensors that read signals from the world around it, and also has effectors that emit signals to the other cells around it. This particular diagram is greatly simplified to highlight a few of the key pathways involved in cancer, but the key point is that the cells aren't entirely self-contained, but are dependent on signals from their environment and are sending out signals to modify surrounding cells. In a perhaps overly reductive sense, the bulk of your body is an extremely elaborate niche constructed to safely house your gonads, which enables extraordinarily complex interactions with the environment and with other bodies, all for the purpose of allowing your gonads to interact with other gonads in a predictable and reliable way. Now, we developmental biologists are used to seeing this phenomenon of reciprocal induction within organism. That is, that there's a constant back and forth of signaling between tissues. The classic example is the vertebrate eye, which forms from a bulge of brain tissue. When that ballooning bit of brain touches the ectoderm, it instructs the skin to start forming a lens. And the lens in turn instructs the brain tissue to form a retina. Their relationship is totally interactive and interdependent. You don't get lens without a signal from the neural tissue, and you don't get a functional retina without a signal from the lens. Niche construction proposes that there's a reasonable extension of this idea of reciprocal induction within a multicellular organism to a further property of reciprocal induction between an organism and its environment. And I'll give you one more example of weird biology before sitting down and shutting up. In lakes in Japan are found frogs and salamanders and frog and salamander tadpoles. On the top of this image are two frog tadpoles, A and B. On the bottom, two salamander tadpoles, C and D. A is a tadpole that finds itself in a pond with no salamanders, while B is a frog tadpole that is detected by chemical signals that salamander tadpoles are also present. So it develops into an alternative form with a wider body. Why? Because the salamander tadpoles can be carnivorous, so it's widening itself so it no longer fits in a salamander's mouth. C is a salamander tadpole that finds itself in a pond with no frogs. If lots of frog tadpoles are present, it develops into form D, an animal with a large broad mouth, the better to swallow frogs whole. This is a mutual inductive response and a kind of arms race 
in two different species of amphibians that is dependent on interactive signals. That is, each is responding to its environment and the environment is responding to the organisms. It's just that the environment, in this case, is another species of amphibian. All right then, to conclude this video about niche construction, which is also about adaptive phenotypic plasticity, I think those two ideas are completely inseparable. Uh, I want to leave you with four key points. So first, organisms do not simply passively respond to the environment. They are active portions of the environment. The environment itself is a product of the organisms within it. So you need to consider both. And I think anybody who's any, any ecological training at all will recognize that this is an important point and pretty much take it for granted. The interactions between organisms and environment are reciprocal. So both are talking to each other. And finally, ecology development and evolution are interdependent. Uh, it's easy for us to build our, our little silos where we talk about our little discipline. Uh, but if you want to really make vast progress, you have to bring them together. And these are three big disciplines that fit so well together and teach us so much about the world. Okay, is any of that revolutionary? I don't think so. I mean, if you talk to any evolutionary biologist, they'll agree with all of those points. And they will also tell you that they are perfectly compatible with modern evolutionary biology. So that doesn't imply that these are unimportant points, of course. Uh, I like to look at these points and see that these are subjects that could consume multiple labs in lifetimes of research to explore and, and expand upon. Uh, and I also just see a lot of nifty and fascinating biology. Okay, so I had to cut a lot of things out of this video because there's so much packed in here. Uh, so I'm thinking that next week what I will probably talk about is one topic that I didn't discuss, and that is genetic accommodation. Genetic accommodation is also another really cool phenomenon uh, that is sometimes taken as incompatible with evolution, but no, it's not. It fits perfectly. There's no, I see absolutely no problem with integrating genetic accommodation and evolutionary theory. Okay. That's enough for now. Thanks for listening, and we will talk to you next week.